very much. It's my pleasure once again to visit with you. Um, I'm actually going to want to be sitting down and talking to you. Um, but I see that you guys are, are really keen on taking notes, so you need the table in front of you to put your books and so on, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to disrupt that. So if, if I pull up a chair somewhere and want to pay it with you, I, I can't find an English word that describes better the Afrikaans, kaya. Um, I can't, there, there is no such word in, in English. Uh, do you guys have one in one of the, the African languages? Um, is, is there a word like that? No. Kaya. You don't know what kaya means. Yeah, because it's difficult to translate kaya. It's um, to visit. It's to visit really. But, but it's not really what you want to say. Yeah, it's more than visit. It's got to do with um, just unbuttoning your soul. And, and letting people see what's going on in the inner workings of your heart and your mind, you know, and, and sharing experiences and stuff like that. Is this going to work? Yes. Yeah, I probably will. Thank you. Let's use this. There we go. All right. Will you still be able to see? Uh, yes. Uh, From back there. Yeah. All right. Is, is everybody fairly well lined up? Yes. yes. Good. So we're going to be, I'm going to be wanting to sharing, be sharing with you some of the processes of my thoughts, my mind, when I get, in a sense, confronted with a specific word or concept. Um, so we're going to be digging together into the scriptures, into references in the Bible. We're going to be cross-checking stuff, etc., etc., etc. So I'm going to be inviting you to join me as we journey through one of the topics on in our in our uh, in our year tonight i have the privilege of talking to you on the topic of mercy okay now the minute i use the word mercy what scripture passage springs to mind knowing that you are part of doxodeo that you understand the doxodeo message and you are schooled in the Doxodeo of Amanda. What scripture immediately springs to mind when you hear the concept mercy? Silence. Ah. All right, the phrase love mercy, walk humbly before your God to love justice. All right, where does that come from? Justly, or to do justly. 
Mm. Okay, maybe we should start the other way around. Let's start with the three dots a day of words. Surrender, serve, All right. To act justly, with which one of those three do you connect that? Just the body of Christ. 
serving also in terms of any and every relationship you find yourself in. The one I'd like us to focus on tonight is the one that we term love. Because pretty much at the foundation of our understanding of mercy, we need to see it within the context of what love is all about. Alright? In Christian Swartz's book, The Three Colors of Love, the Natural Church Development Resource, how many of you are aware of this book or of these resources? I think we did one, but not this particular one last year. Last year, I think we visited on the Three Colors yes. of Ministry. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, good, good. That was the lay ministry component of serve. All right. Now we're on the love component of serve. Good. Love, as I mentioned last year, some of you might well have remembered that we mentioned that love is like light. There are three primary colors to light. And just as light has three primary colors, each one discernible in the, in the totality of the spectrum of color. Three colors, three primary colors of light. So love also has three primary colors. Would you want to hazard a guess as to what those three primary colors or three primary segments of the spectrum of love, what those three are? What of them would be? Green. Uh, we're going to light now. Yes, the three colors. We said one of them is green, one of them is red. Red, and the other one is? Yeah. Yellow is French. <laughs> 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 red, green, and blue. Right? Red, green, blue. Yellow is a combination of green and blue. Alright? Red, green, blue, three colors of light. Now, when we move into the whole understanding of love, there are also three primary concepts that we connect with the totality of love. Have any idea what they would be? Let me give you a clue. Tells us. 
that God's way of giving expression to who He is, God who is invisible, has given expression to Himself so that we can engage with Him. What form or what process or what manifestation did God choose to enable us to be able to engage with Him? Christ the Son. No man has seen God at any time, says John 1. The only begotten of the Father, who is in the wisdom of the Father, He has declared it. That's John 1, I think, John 1 verse 27. I don't agree. Would someone check me out? Those of you who have the Bible, please. Was it John 3, 27? I'm almost sure it's John 1. Oh, not first John. If God is love and Christ is the manifestation, the physical, how should we say, the, the physical manifestation of God who is invisible. God is love. Therefore, love in that sense is invisible until it becomes manifest in some other physical form or human process. Jesus is the one who has come to manifest to us the heart, the nature, the character, the love of God. Help me with that reference. John 1 18. Awesome, thank you. Good. So if Jesus came to manifest the love of God to us, where do we find the connection between who Jesus is, what He can communicate, and the three primary segments of the spectrum of love. Where do we find those pictures, those concepts, those connections? I'm telling you tonight, I'm unbuttoning my soul, I'm helping you to go through some of the thought processes that I would be going through when confronted with, you need to talk on this. Just rephrase the question. I really didn't get it. Don't follow the question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. God is love, mm -hmm. but God is invisible. Mm -hmm. Jesus is visible. Jesus is the manifestation of the love of God. Mm -hmm. yes. What do we have in who Jesus is that helps us to connect with, ah, oh, this is love. This is one facet of the love of God. There's another facet of the love of God. Here's another facet of the love of God. If love is a triune phenomenon, you speak. You speak. Holy Spirit today. Is spirit. Spirit. Yeah. Spirit. Uh, we are now moving into the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah, but when he was, he, 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 before he was, he said, I want to be a liar, um, call the people, the economic spirit, they come forth. I will teach you not to do anything. So now, as the uh, spirit opens our minds, allows us to see what God is doing for us. Because out of the natural, we cannot see what God is doing. Like when we are in the spirit, we are able to see that. Why the world can it? Okay, we're going to put this conversation on hold because you are moving into a whole different arena. You're taking us to a place where we are not ready to converse yet. <laughs> you are 17 steps ahead of us. We're going to have to backtrack for the sake of the rest of the class. But hold on to this, we will get there. Maybe tonight even. We will get there. Okay. Backtrack. When Jesus comes onto the scene, who was the one who was set up to introduce Jesus to the world? John the Baptist. Alright. What did John the Baptist say about Jesus? The man of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay. One major statement about Jesus. In fact, John made three major statements about Jesus. First of them, he said he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Cool. What else did he say about Jesus? He said he is the one to baptize you in the Spirit. All right, he's the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I just baptize you in the 
All right, that's a reference to what it would do. Not necessarily a reference to who he is. I want to separate those two for a moment. Okay? Yes, he said a number of things about what Jesus would do. But the statements in terms of who Jesus is. He said he is the name of God. Alright? And then he followed that up by saying, obviously, the Lamb of God will come to take away the sin of the world. Cool. But what else did he say about Jesus? That he is the? Ah, oh, he is the Son of God. Cool. Alright. And as the Son of God, he has authority. Um, the things that he says, he's coming to establish the kingdom of God, etc., etc. Okay? That's good. What else do they have to say about who Jesus is? Yeah, I, I see when the children referring to the mother as a woman, 
at that particular moment, Jesus did not see himself as the Son of God. Awesome, thank you. He had already made the shift in his own mind yeah. that he was not the son of Mary. Something happened. Up until what point was he quite happy to be known as the son of Mary? And when did that shift take place? At his baptism, when the Spirit of God rested upon him and the voice of the Father of the heavens declared in a sonship ceremony, this is now my son in whom I well pleased. From that moment, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Anointed One, ceased to be known in the heavenlies and chose on earth also to cease to be known as the son of Joseph the Mary. He became at that moment known as the Son of God. Okay? The very next day after, or let's say, the, the, the season immediately following the declaration from heaven, this is my son, his mother is in conversation with him and he responds to her not by saying, Mama, don't bother me, I'm at the wedding. No, he says to her, Woman, to communicate to her, I am no longer under your jurisdiction. And if I do anything about this, it's not because you are asking me. It's because my father will be telling me that something needs to be done. Okay? So that first statement, woman, what am I to do with you? That settles that. Settles the place of his authority. Okay? Settles the issue of him being the son of God. Cool. The next statement, my time has not yet come. What was that a reference to? Yeah, I see this as reflecting very two things. First of all, he looks at the uh, the pouring uh, out of his blood to save the world. Okay, pouring out of his blood. Yes. Yeah. But now we see in the same same scenario at the wedding, the wedding. he also had to save the situation because they ran out of the wine. They ran out of wine. So yeah. where's the connection? There is a connection between the two scenarios. Uh huh. Yeah. The crucifixion, the pouring out of his blood, and the fact that there was no wine. But also, we find him uh, making a statement, Jesus says, on the Lord's Supper, he says, Take this cup and make this will be sent to me. Okay, but isn't that something that he makes the connection with at the very last moment of his early ministry? Yeah. He brings that connection there. Yeah. It wasn't the first time yeah. they had had communion together, yeah. the Feast of the Passover. But it was the first time that he makes that connection. Was he saying that at the wedding, you're premature. I'm not yet going to make this connection. I can't do anything now because my time has not yet come to make that connection. I think so. Okay. Not, 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 yeah, not necessarily because we find Jesus at this scene. Even the setup, how he was in the, in the way, though the mother was well known in the community, mm -hmm. nobody regarded him as anyone anyway. But in his mind, wherever he walked in this ceremony, immediately, as, as you see in the first place, there was a mind shift. Mm -hmm. Whenever Jesus would talk to people, people would not understand him because every time he would answer, yeah. he answers from the heavenly way, exactly. not from the yes. earthly way. All right, awesome. Uh, uh, now, in that when he's answering these people, he answered them according to this is the earthly need you need. You need this salvation. Right. But the time of salvation has not come. Not meaning you really need the physical one. Uh -huh. This is what he was referring to. Okay. Okay. I hear you. But I think there's a, there's a, there's a simpler uh -huh. connection to be made. Um, and I'm not discounting anything that you said. I'm not saying that is not valid. But I think there's a simpler connection, an easier, quicker connection to be made. I think, um, first of all, when, when if, you, if you read the whole chapter, um, that he talks about his brothers or, or friends or whatever that was on their way to this, to this wedding, and he said, right. no, I'm not going. Because he, at the time already he was waiting to hear from God whether he's supposed to go or not. Okay. So I think for the mere fact that he went afterwards being instructed in by God to go, mm -hmm shows to me that there was a reason why it had to be there. Okay. And, and that is then where the wine, water turned into wine, 
war signal was to happen at the time because it was really it, it, the first thing that it did after now being called the sun. Mm -hmm. that, that is just my conclusion. We just need to be careful with the chronology here. I think you're hinting at the John 6, end of John 6, beginning of John 7 scenario, mm -hmm. where uh, everyone was going out for the feast mm -hmm. and they were asking him, aren't you going? Yes. And he said, ah, not this time. And then we went secretly. Yes. And on the last day of the feast, he called out and everyone was thirsty. Um, they didn't come to me and walk that I would give would be like streams of living water flowing from his innermost being. That's, I think, I, this is happening before that. The invitation to the wedding happened before that event. So in terms of chronology, not quite there yet. Okay? John 2, he's invited to the wedding together with his mother and he brings his disciples along. Let me ask some questions here to get you on, on to where I think we need to find the key to unlock this. When he turned the water into the wine, where was the wine taken to? Who was the first person to taste the water that was turned into wine? The master of ceremonies. Master of ceremonies. Okay. And he was so pleased and so surprised, he stops the whole procedure and he addresses an individual to compliment that individual on the quality of the wine that he, that individual, has provided. Was that individual Jesus? No. no. Who was the individual that he addresses? The bridegroom. Why would the master of ceremonies address the bridegroom and compliment the bridegroom on his choice of wine? Why? Isn't that because it was like his responsibility to make sure that he's wine? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's the bridegroom's responsibility to provide the wine yes. at the wedding. Yes. So when Jesus says, my time has not yet come, what is he referring to? My time, my opportunity to take responsibility to provide the wine for my wedding has not yet come. What is he saying about himself? in that particular statement. No, not that he is the master of ceremonies. He is the bridegroom. Absolutely. Can you see the three pictures unfolding in John's gospel of who Jesus is? He is the Lamb of God. He is the Son of God. He is the heavenly bridegroom. This is who Jesus is. Is this making sense? Yes. Is this stirring your spirit? Yes. yes it should. <laughs> it's stirring mine. Why would John then go to all the trouble to open up for us these three pictures? What does he want to tell us by communicating that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God? What does he want to communicate by telling us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? What does he want to communicate by hinting or showing us that Jesus Christ is the Heavenly Bridegroom? Just on the Heavenly Bridegroom thing, the connection that we find, firstly Jesus hints at being the Bridegroom, but not at that wedding. John the Baptist, when he is confronted by the Pharisees, who ask him, so who are you and what? mandate do you have for what you are doing? He talks, John the Baptist talks about being the friend of the bridegroom. Saying that it is his privilege to focus the attention of the bride on the bridegroom. And when the bridegroom arrives, the friend of the bridegroom, his job is over. Because you see, they begin to, they begin to cross-examine John, asking him, so how do you feel now that the person that you baptized and introduced into the community, he is now baptizing more people than you are? There are more people following him than are following you. How does John answer that? No, I didn't think it would work that way. I thought I would still have more baptism than me. No. John immediately moves into the role. He says, but up until now, I have been the friend of the bridegroom. I have been calling the bride to attention so that the bridegroom could step into 
the limelight and the conversation between the bride and the bridegroom can begin. And when that happens, as the friend of the bridegroom, I step away. And I leave them in conversation with each other to make their promises, to, to communicate their vows, to connect, <coughs> and to start out in life happily married. If the friend of the bridegroom is constantly wanting to engage in that conversation, he becomes a hindrance, not a help. So John the Baptist hints at Jesus being the friend of being the bridegroom and he himself being the friend of the bridegroom. Jesus himself hints at being the bridegroom, but not at that particular wedding. So here we have both John the Baptist and Jesus connecting with that image of the heavenly bridegroom. So Jesus is the Lamb of God, is the Son of God, is the heavenly bridegroom. What does John want to tell us? If God is love, and love has three primary expressions, then these are the primary expressions of the love of God in the person and the mission of Jesus Christ. <coughs> what are the three primary expressions or facets of love? Love God. To love spirit, God. Yes, spirit to spirit. Internal. 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 Well, that would be bringing your whole worldview into alignment and living from eternal reality, living from revelation. True. But that's not necessarily where we want to be on these three. Okay. Intimacy. 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 One of the facets of love 